Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Welcome to another edition of the Suleiman Ravid Show. We are coming to you live from our studios here in Sunny Hill, Johannesburg, this uh, beautiful Friday evening. Nice, warm, hot summer's uh, evening. Uh, January is about to bid us uh, farewell tomorrow, yeah? Is it uh, tomorrow, 1st of February? Uh, they say that uh, February is the, the first real working month uh, of the year. January has a kind of holiday flavor to the first part of it anyway. Then you get going and kids go back to school and then you get back to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, the grind, to the groove of doing things, whatever you want to call it. But um, the lesson for us and, and, and a lesson that we need to remind ourselves of uh, ever so often is that time waits for no one, yeah? It just the other day, it seems like we were talking about the December holidays that's come and gone. January has come and gone. And the countdown is already on for Ramadan, less than uh, three months. Uh, before you realize, another couple of weeks and the first term of uh, school will be over, miss, uh, just towards the uh, third week of March. And then uh, uh, you come back from that and you're on the, on the doorstep of Ramadan and you come out of Ramadan and almost half of the year is gone. And that's how it goes. So therefore, as believers, every day you make the most of it, you focus, you discipline, you manage your time well, and you ensure that uh, you take uh, maximum out of uh, every day, every hour, every minute, every second, because every second is a bounty. It's a great favor from Allah wa ta'ala upon us. Ask those people uh, when the inevitable moment came, when it's time now for you to leave this world, uh, you know, you wish you had that one more second or that one more minute or that one more hour uh, or one day or one week uh, that, uh, but then it's, it's, it's too late. So whilst we have it and whilst we uh, do have the opportunity, let's make uh, the most of it. Right, so schools usually open first and then universities start to open uh, a little later, different universities at different times. But it's at around this period now that universities are starting to open. Some have opened, some will open, uh, some are still doing the whole pre-opening uh, preparations and that kind of thing. But it's a good, it's a good time to talk about, um, you know, uh, the state of uh, universities, to talk about Muslim presence in universities. And joining us this evening on the program, we have the newly elected uh, president of the MSA Union, and that is uh, Shakil Garda. Shakil, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome once again to the program. Welcome, salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and shukran for having me this evening on this program. MSA, people are familiar with. Uh, tell us about MSA Union. So let's first see if people are familiar with MSA. Mm. That's the Muslim Students Association. Uh, and MSA Union is the umbrella body of all of the chapters that have an MSA on them. So we'll talk about 30 campuses roughly with an MSA at the campus and then MSA Union heading that all up. MSA Union was established in 2011 as a guidance structure for what campuses were doing as well as governance and oversight where we found that there was this unity across the country with regards to what students were doing. And uh, it's still a new journey I think for Union having not been in existence for so many years and actually having begun first as a national organization, the MSA did back in its uh, 1970s formative years. Uh, today we're looking to go back a bit to the way that campuses once marched in the same direction. So that's where MSA Union fits in. Let, let's, let's just put it all into context, right? Uh, in essence, what does an MSA do at the campus and, and where does the union fit in now? What, what will be the role of the union in terms of that national footprint? So every campus has, I think, the sole mandate of providing the needs to the Muslim students in, in particular but then students in general as well. So the Muslim student would obviously need a place to pray Salah, to have the calendars uh, as much as possible aligning to, for example, Ramadan, Iftar times, to have the calendars allowing for Eid to be taken off, and for halal food to at least be accessible, whether provided by the residences or at least to be purchased at campus. Or if that can't take place, then at least for context to be made for those who do need the halal food. Uh, and obviously there are other programs that take place at the campus, such as tarbiya programs, da'wa programs, social programs, political programs, to sort of groom and shape the young um, student for what the world has to offer later on, and to create a space that Muslims can feel safe and free in, despite the challenges that the university does face, inevitably. So it can be a social club, it can be a spiritual club, a religious club, it just depends what you make of it. And uh, the MSA, fortunately or unfortunately, has to cater to all those needs. And then MSA Union comes in whereby we look at all the campuses that exist nationally, trying to garner and help uh, along so that it happens in a, in a uniform fashion. Although each campus has, of course, the autonomy to be unique in their own approaches, some campuses have only certain faculties and will cater such um, programs to suit those faculties alone. But uh, largely, MSA Union fits in uh, meeting 
at least once a year in a national gathering, trying to get minds uh, around the ideas around Tarbiya, for example, looking at how to be spiritual and active in the community, looking at how um, to make good intentions with regards to our degrees. So we aren't just there willingly at campus, but we actually have a high purpose. And uh, meeting with campuses uh, once a year during inductions, where the nitty gritty around governance, around constitutions, around structure, around uh, the kind of Juma programs that take place and so on, are discussed. And uh, so it's quite a multi pronged approach the union has to fulfill. But we do so to the best of our ability and, of course, with much support from our campuses themselves as well. Because many mm -hmm. of us actually were, of course, on campuses before uh, serving on the union chapter. Now, before we talk about, you know, the vision and the ideas that you have going forward now as the newly elected president of the MSC Union, let, let's just talk about the last term. Uh, what took place? What were some of the highlights? So for me, I was serving as the campus liaisons of the last term. And uh, we had a conference and as well as a camp during the term. The conference focused on policy, so policy drafting of our actual organization. That meant that we spoke about governance, about transformation and gender, about Dawa and Tarbiya and looking at the way that the MSA itself functions. So when a campus has an issue, who do they turn to? What are the internal structures that need to be uh, meted out? How do we get MSA from what it is to what it ought to be? Mm. And uh, it was quite a formal thing. It took place at uh, Wits University in uh, a Senate style, whereby students were introduced to this new style of MSA being um, in debates and in closed rooms and so on. And uh, I think it did uh, jog people's memories back to being at university politics if, if they were involved. Also, it jogged the old, old guard of the MSA's founders being, uh, seeing us taking things quite seriously. And then at the end of our term, we had a camp, which was more uh, in a relaxed environment in KZN. And we were able to reflect on the nature that Osfant Al has, of course, created, whereby we are able to reflect but also for us to adopt those policies after a few months went by where campuses were able to engage them and say that, yes, we actually do agree with them. And um, alhamdulillah, with that uh, particular camp, we were able to, to reflect on our purpose coming into the new term and an election took place as well. So there was two national gatherings that happened in one year. And the year before that was done merely to rebuild our relationships with our chapters, as I explained, them being 30 and us being one union body. Uh, it was no uh, easy task to get uh, to know everybody once again and reestablish the ties. Well, where does the funding come from? How, is the, how does the union sustain itself and its activities? So, Alhamdulillah, union has established a wakaf uh, with OCAF South Africa. Uh, union also enjoys relationships with different organizations uh, across the country who donate and who assist, who have been on the MSA themselves. And many of the organizations that went on to become uh, founded by people that were on the MSA themselves see value in assisting us now, um, provided that our vision is, of course, in the line with what they seem to be something fit. And we try to build those relationships quite well. But we also do have fundraising schemes, although the, the last term didn't happen through actual dinners or anything like that. It, uh, it happened over tables where we had to explain what our vision was and why um, it was uh, important for them to fund us. And uh, we do have many sponsors that can be uh, seen in our social media pages as well, which I won't mention now for failure to, to not mention any. Um, but uh, we're trying to, to increase the idea of Wakaf among young people so that our community can live that way as well. Uh, and it starts off with, with being 20 years old at university, trying to marry your uh, intellectual ideas with what the Wakaf system was supposed to be. And uh, we do, of course, appeal to the community who are listening now as well that please do assist us. You know, our, pro our projects do need financial assistance, and uh, we can get in touch, of course, after this. But um, your, your money won't be ill spent because our programs do try to, to touch almost every base that a Muslim student needs to be touched while they are still a student. Because we know when we leave campus, uh, life, t life tends to get to us. And we don't want it to be that we didn't have the, these few years at least spent uh, in Ibadah and, of course, in good social activities that will guide how we do our degrees and our careers later on, inshallah. What kind of buy-in do, do the MSAs on average enjoy from Muslim students on campus? And, and what kind of buy-in uh, does the MSA union get? Uh, are, are you getting support from the majority of Muslim students on campuses? So let's first start with the first question. I think there are many students on campuses who are Muslim. And there are many students who know the MSA but might not join the MSA for all its activities, but at least for the access to the musallah, for example. And there are many reasons for this. So sometimes they feel that the MSA doesn't speak to them as students. And I think that's been the failing at some campuses to be branded in such a way that it is welcoming to all. Um, from the people that are at the sign-up desk during a week to the programs that are hosted, 
And that's why the MSA has a tough task of having to provide socially, spiritually, politically, uh, even to the fun aspect as well. Um, MSA kind of has to be all things to all people and all at the same time not, uh, because that uh, shows a lack of focus as well. So with, with that in mind, we have some uh, members on the campus who wouldn't be uh, affiliated to the MSA particularly, but would be there for certain events, maybe iftar or for, uh, for Jumu'ah. But we are trying to increase that by uh, understanding that we cannot be um, we, ha we have to be all things to all people with a vision. So every two years, the theme will be specific to that particular uh, MSA Union's theme. So the theme last time was uh, the intellectual jihad, trying to get people to think about the degrees they are doing and how they can actually further the fight of Islam and the good fight for Islam in our countries and in our world. Today, it's about for the fard kifaya, which is fulfilling our social societal obligations. And hopefully that theme will filter that down to campus level and appeal to the average person that didn't think the MSA was for them, but that now will because they feel like it gives them purpose. Then to answer the second question with regards to MSA Union, mm. um, we've had to do a year or two of getting to know our campuses and explaining to them why an umbrella body was necessary, um, why the policies were necessary, and why governance is necessary, so that when issues do arise, they are uh, mediated well and respectfully, and that we are the ones who have been on campus before, maybe for two or three years on the campus level, that uh, hopefully we are trustworthy to be able to serve and to guide and to, to shape what happens at campus level. And we aren't here to, of course, shout and, and, and scream, but also just to guide and to be tactful about doing so. And I think, alhamdulillah, through the national gatherings that have taken place, there has been a, a great increase in how campuses see themselves as part of the national body and the national picture. And they're meeting one another as well and sharing ideas. And uh, for example, somebody would see somebody else's a week idea and say, maybe we should adopt that. All campuses are getting to know one another and forming regional structures in the center of the Cape and the KZN region, as well as Limpopo, whereby people are now having events at their localized level as well. So we're getting there definitely, but I think it has happened through diplomacy and through good to us and through good traveling as well. You know, being a traveler as Islam also encourages us, has allowed us to meet with one another and get to know one another and the different dynamics that exist across the country. All right, uh, we'll leave it there for now. We take uh, our first commercial break. When we come back, we continue the discussion with uh, Shaquille Garda. Welcome back. So our guest in studio this evening is Shakil Garda. He's the newly elected president of the MSA Union. Prior to the break, he was explaining to us the role of the MSA, the role of the MSA Union, and, and some of what they have done in the last uh, few years. You now a new leader, fresh mandate. What are your thoughts? What, what are, what's your vision? It's, it's a two-year term, I understand, right? Yes, what, yes. What, what's, what, what do you have in mind? What's the plan of action? So, inshallah, I hope to ground our, our team in good teamwork, first of all. Uh, us understanding one another, and we have done so by having a set plan meeting. But uh, we're looking to imbibe the idea of the Fard Kifaya, which is the societal obligation that we have as students in each and every student. So when they come to university, they actually feel that their degree has a purpose that will serve the community one day, whether they are more obviously a doctor or a pediatrician, for example, to people that are studying law as well, or even involved in government policy and education, seeing each of those faculties and, and streams as a way to serve us as well as the gaps in our community. So the idea is that we cannot wait for the gaps to be filled. We have to fill them now. And just like in Salah, when the, when the stuff in front of you has one man short, you have to step forward. Mm. Uh, so we're hoping to get that idea driven throughout all the campuses. But to do so, we need to fo focus on the basic level, first of all, which is to teach uh, the ideas in, in the arkan of Islam, as well as also looking at uh, things like Husl and are we able to even do Husl. We understand that the term kifaya or kifayat was used uh, by the communities of old to describe the janazah itself because mm. it was due to the community's duty that that person would be hustled and buried. So we're trying to bring that back for, for one and also to take that term and actually extrapolate it to everything that we're doing at campus level, be it through the feeding schemes that happen, the charity that takes place, the Ramadan that happens and the programs that take place around that. And uh, almost everything that we, that we do should be able to uh, fit into this framework. So that when we are sh unsure of something, we can look back and say, are we on the right track? And uh, like every term, like every team that happens, uh, that comes in into office, we need to look at ourselves and see whether we're checking ourselves and whether our communication is, is on point and whether we are actually on the ground and actually meeting with real life campuses and the issues. Because of course, uh, a union doesn't really exist without these chapters. And uh, while we do do a lot of our things during, uh, through digital and through social media, we do need to be meeting with them quite often. And hopefully our team, which is quite widely spread across the country, the Cape, Cazid, and Limpopo, and Central Region as well, uh, will hopefully facilitate that easily. 
Well, what are some of the challenges that you're currently facing at, at MSA Union level? So with MSA Union, uh, we have logistics as a big challenge. And uh, getting the buy-in from our campuses who were never used to necessarily an umbrella body, uh, not telling them what to do, but at least saying, listen, guys, we think this or we think that. So with the result of us being there now for the past two years, having revived uh, the idea of, a, uh, of an upper structure, although the previous terms of MSA Union did do this, I think the past uh, term was definitely vital in having metal chapters a lot more. Today we need uh, the chapters to now buy into this idea of a theme and hopefully that the events can buy into the theme as well. Mm. And um, all of us need to engage critically in how much we understand Islam, first of all, and how much we understand these ter terminologies that are often used only when we are older and hopefully wiser, but our question is why can't we start now? So uh, with communication being a big hindrance, we try to meet as much as we can and have these national gatherings that uh, appeal to all and are also welcoming and safe for all our students to attend, as well as cost effective. But this does come with challenges. And uh, yeah, I think for us, it's just about having unity in our, in our community and having the, the older community, the more established community behind us and understanding us as well so the dialogue can be facilitated very easily. What impact does uh, the MSA and the MSA union have on, on non-Muslim students at, at universities? Are your activities pretty much focused on, on Muslims or is there, is there opportunity? Uh, do you have the resources to be able to do some outreach, to be able to do some dawah, to be able to um, engage in a way where many of the common misconceptions with regards to Islam are then explained and, and, and debunked? So uh, I think that we, this happens uh, in different levels and degrees at campuses. There are designated dawah and tarbiyah offices at each campus. Some campuses which do not have these will, inshallah, be instituting this quite soon. And by doing so, they have internal tarbiyah or guidance or training, and then they have outward dawah. And mm. those who are trained can they, therefore go outward and speak about Islam. And we always say it doesn't have to be that you know each and every fact about Islam, but that you, you can spread the message, whether it's through akhlaq, through good manners, or through a good smile, or even having a table, which does happen at some campuses, whereby uh, quite tough discussions are had, and people are able to come ask Muslim students about what they heard on TV, for example. And uh, we encourage campuses to do this by even painting walls at campus with um, messages that ask questions so people can be provoked in a way to think, hey, but I didn't realize that about Islam. Maybe let's go ask the MSA. And uh, as I said, it is quite different for, for each campus, but our drive this year is definitely to increase that level of engagement so that the most intellectual people, or hopefully, that, uh, that are at, at university are also engaging on how Islam can be the solution bringer for the very tough questions that they're asking themselves about does Allah exist, does God exist, um, are, we, are, we a universe, um, are we living in a universe where there is an afterlife or are we merely just living here for, for the dunya? Uh, and these questions are tough and I think for us as students as well, being able to feel them is tough as well. But hopefully with our intentions being made pure and with the resources that we have being um, provided by training with different Dawah groups across the country, we'll be looking at this uh, more firmly for the next two years and hopefully people will know exactly what a Muslim is, what a Muslim does, how a Muslim prays and that a Muslim isn't a particular race group or, or culture, but that Islam in this country at least is a diverse one and that it should be seen uh, through our, our dressing and through our actions that Islam is not just merely one particular group's Islam, it is broad-based broad and therefore hopefully bringing more people into the fold, whether through actual Aqidah or through Iman or just to get to know one another and to spend time at events and uh, engagement so that in class we are sitting next to one another as foreigners. Mm. Political involvement at, at campuses, uh, is that part of, of, of what the MSA looks like or do you try and stay you know, very neutral on these issues? We know that university students can become very highly politicized and some of them then actually go on uh, to the big national stage. You think of uh, someone like Mbusin in Dluzi uh, from, from the EFF. Do, do, you, do, do you get involved in, in political issues, political debates uh, as, as an MSA or, or an MSA union? So, so MSA Union itself is neutral in terms of who it politically aligns with, meaning that we don't align with anybody. Mm. However, at campus level, each campus has the autonomy to decide on good basis and with good reason to align for a particular cause uh, in, in particular or as a p permanent alliance in general. What that means is that MSA at a campus level might decide to be p politically aligned with, for example, the, the Progressive Youth Alliance or the EFF or the, uh, the DA, uh, which is DASO, or whoever else particularly aligns at the time, and that they would then forward agendas, for example, for students to be represented at SRC level and Muslim issues to be tabled at uh, a campus level. So it doesn't just remain within the Musalla that it gets discussed, but it actually goes broader. So there are pros and cons to this, of course, but I think that uh, we encourage uh, MSAs to be 
engaged intellectually before politically so that they understand if they are going to align politically that the MSA and its, and its image and Islam and its image is taken first and foremost as guidance. We don't believe in being unpoliticized because we understand that our country has political issues all the time and that as Muslims we need to be navigating them and that Islam in itself has a space for politics although that politics has to be guided by first principles and what we encourage campuses to do now is to look at those first principles and then speak that into the space inshallah when they are engaging with political parties so that they can understand what Islam offers from an economic perspective, from a uh, halal food perspective, from a student politics perspective and even from a fees perspective with for example the Waqaf system being one that could assist with that. Hmm. But the idea is that the, the student itself who, or he or herself that is involved politically has to take a mandate from the campus itself and that mandate can be checked and, and engaged in all the time to make sure that we are represented quite adequately should it come to SRC elections or even when they do move on to um, national structures later on in life. What, what is the, the MSA and whether it aligns or it doesn't align or how it aligns? Uh, is there a kind of conscious effort to get Muslim students in, in, in universities more politically conscious, more politically involved, uh, more vocal on political issues? So I think, first of all, we do have a political and international affairs office within the MSA Union, and the individual then has to guide each uh, political or, or, or transformation officer at their campus in particular? And the answer is yes, without it being the only agenda that we have, of course we do have many other forms and focuses throughout our term, that is definitely one of them because we find that students are voiceless and that if Islam is the answer to our problems in this country and in the world, then we need to have a voice and platform for that to be spoken through. And politics is mostly the way that that happens. So, um, for example, the gender-based violence issue. We understand that Islam speaks about how the genders interact with one another. We understand that Islam speaks to men about how they treat their wives or their spouses or their sisters and, and anyone that they interact with in the world. Um, and we understand that if that is true, that Islam does have a way that our etiquette can be spoken to as a national uh, stage to say that this is how we, we should be engaging nationally. And if, unfortunately, without politics, we cannot uh, be heard or spoken um, uh, spoken about or spoken to at that level, then we'll be falling short on providing those solutions to our country. So um, although there, there, are, uh, there is a need for us to understand how best to do politics, I think definitely we would like our campus to be active. Um, preferably independently, but mm. if an alliance does need to be formed, then it has to be strategic and it has to be done with the utmost um, wisdom and thought having been put through to it. All right, time for another break. When we come back, we will be wrapping up the discussion with uh, Shaquille Garda, the newly elected president of MSA Union. Welcome back. So we've got Shaquille Garda in studio this evening. He's the newly elected president of uh, MSA Union, the, the umbrella body of MSAs on campuses in South Africa. And uh, in the last two segments, we've spoken about what the MSAs do, what does the union do. We've also spoken about some of their activities and how they fit in with the SRC, etc. Shikil, we, we've seen in recent days, there's, there's quite a bit of tension, violence, protests at some of the universities. It's an ongoing issue from a few years ago with the Fees Must Fall campaign. Does the union have an official position on, 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 what, on what's transpiring currently? So essentially, we've always said, and this is from before my time as well, that when you protest, you protest peacefully, you don't harm the environment that uh, you find yourself in. Because, of course, students have to then benefit from that environment later on having been uh, destroyed, it will be of no use to the student uh, in particular. And we have been involved in political struggles at campuses with regards to the Freedom Must Fall movement, although not in large numbers. Uh, from an official stance, we've always said that it is important for us to be involved, that it is up to us to stand for social justice, and it is up, up to us to bring the change that we want to see. Although this does differ from campus to campus, and many students find it difficult to register or to pay the upfront fees, and that speaks to a systemic issue of how much fees are being charged, as well as the students being un unable to afford it, and then society not prioritizing these students as those who will go out into the, into the world and to fix the problems our country has. So what MSA Union is saying is that we need, first of all, the funding so that the protests can stop, so that students can actually go to university and focus on the primary reason for being there. But until that happens, unfortunately, the students will be protesting. And while union doesn't say do not protest, we are saying protest peacefully. We are saying uh, to be guided by principles that protests uh, would be productive and effective and not you know, earmarked uh, with a certain negative image, which, of course, many people do have of protests. But as Muslims, we're telling our Muslim students in particular, don't shy away from the protest. Don't think it's a, it's a us and a them issue mm. if you have a financial backing or if you are well, well off or if it's not uh, something that you are used to doing. Because, in fact, if we are there in, in our numbers, in fact, more can actually happen because our voices then um, uh, rebound and 
the campus hears most of us, most students speaking. Unfortunately, when you leave it up to only those who are suffering directly from the issue to protest or to be speaking up, then it leaves them alone vulnerable. And us who are able to then speak loudly with them uh, in, our, in our homes or in our, in our studies, being very fixated on that, are unable to then miss an opportunity whereby we could have been able to assist others who are less fortunate than ourselves, or even amongst us who are unfortunate and who do not have the, the funds or the fees, but in our community it might be something that people don't speak about, that we should say, let's not stop speaking about it. Let's actually say that we do have a fees issue, even in our communities as Muslims, and that we need the assistance from our elders in our, our communities in the business world as well to assist us, and that when protests do happen, we don't speak in armchairs about how violent students have been uh, behaving, but rather speak to the systemic issues that, that actually lead to those protests in, in particular. I think you raise a very important point that uh, if you come from a background of privilege, you, your parents can afford to pay your fees, you shouldn't totally you know, distance yourself and say, well, that's their problem, let them protest if they want to protest, it's got nothing to do with me. Uh, there has to be uh, a degree of solidarity, you need to be outspoken in terms of you know, those people who can't afford it and the challenges that they face, and in some instances the challenges are very acute, where forget paying fees, they can't, they can't uh, even afford food, and, and they're having to you know, uh, keep themselves hungry just to be able to, to continue with their studies. Uh, that said, there are those who feel that we should also, and students also, should take a stand when it comes to violence because things can spiral out of control. Infrastructure uh, can be damaged, which then uh, compromises the, the education of all the students. If there's prolonged shutting down of campuses, that's also quite counterproductive. And if there are unrealistic demands, which, which sometimes seems to be the case, uh, in terms of you know, to what extent the, 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 the assistance must be rendered, then we, we cannot turn a blind eye to that because of, of the, the issue pertaining to fees, which is a valid one. Well, what's your thought on that? So I think, again, it's about balance. So uh, when violence is taking place and you are a Muslim student in that space and you have leadership qualities or you are in a position of leadership, and to be complicit in the violence and the promotion thereof would then be irresponsible. Mm. Then it would be the duty on that person to say, that there are other ways of doing this. And if it is going to management, who is often turning a blind eye and a, and a, and a silent ear to students, um, then that is why students are primarily protesting. Then it would be to guide the, the protesting, and as I said earlier, for that to be done in a way that is tactful and, and smart and wise. Although Muslims aren't always at those uh, upper echelons of leadership in, at student levels, which is also because Muslims have been disengaged all the time. So we're speaking about a cycle here where uh, the morals and, 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 uh, and values we think we've been taught or brought up with all the time isn't making it to the, to the upper stages of university life, and then we cannot be there to guide our, our fellow students. Although when violence does take place, it is something that should be spoken against because uh, any student uh, library or student building that is burnt will not be able to be used by the very student that needs it later on. We understand that at some campuses, especially not universities like Fitz and UCT, for example, where the, the media is always watching them and always getting the privilege of being um, giving platform, the, the bread and butter issues are so much uh, more dire and never condoning the violence that takes place. But I think even myself, to be, sp to be speaking on their behalf would be disingenuous, not knowing what they're going through, uh, that that violence sometimes is the, the last resort that, they, that, they, that they're going to. The question is then, why is that happening? Because that's not only happening at campus levels, it's happening at municipal levels as well. Mm. That and our, our community is disengaged from those issues as well due to our privilege. That the violence is, is a way that our country is calling out and saying we need help. And it's up to all of us to say to government and to say to even campus uh, uh, affairs and campus management that let's try and find a way for students to come with dignity to campus to eat the very basic good quality food. And we know that halal and toy is, is, is something that we've grown up with. Let's try and go and channel that, and I'm actually asking the community now who, who are listening, that let us be able to get halal food onto campuses. Let us be able to get fees affordable for students, and if the fees are not going to change, then at least let us assist in paying for them. Because Muslim students who are at campus are not eating halal uh, food that is of good quality. They're eating halal food that is maybe substandard, or having to fork out money that they're already paying to university to eat, again, because the campus food is not halal or good for them. So what I'm basically saying is that Protests will continue, just like strikes will continue, just like labor um, uh, outcries will continue, until those in responsible positions of power actually seek to care and to worry and to, and to have concern for the deeper issues that our country is riddled with. And students are not immune to those issues. What, what, what's your analysis on, on challenges that Muslim students face at campuses? So I find that Muslim students are coming to campus from different backgrounds and are shoved into a space where there are no parents, there are no elders, there are no um, big brothers and sisters to, to help you and guide you. And the MSA ought to be that space. And there are uh, people bringing um, 
uh, elements of closed mindedness or elements of uh, you know boys clubs or girls clubs mm. wherever they come from certain schools that they come from where they are clicky for example only wanting to be friends with their with their muslims that they come from their communities that they come from whether it's a farm town or a school uh, in Johannesburg or in Cape Town or in Durban for example where um, that also hinders the process of Islam spreading because I'm only friends with you because we look the same or we speak the same. Um, another issue is I think substance abuse is definitely a huge issue at our campuses and Muslims either find themselves uh, involved in that or tempted to be involved in that and I think that we do have to take a good stance in trying to create a space whereby that isn't being shifted under the rug as it is happening outside of campus with our families and communities but that we actually give students a good way of curbing that and actually coming out of those um, issues as well. Another issue is the way that the genders uh, interact with one another. So male and female come into campus, uh, maybe they've been in a school where there was no um, men and women at, at the time, or there was always, but uh, we, we find that there's a lot of catcalling happening at campus, so guys will sit uh, along a bench and the girls will walk past, for example, and the etiquette of, of engagement is not happening in a way that is sober and, and sound. So I think that we need to be speaking about basic levels of uh, adab and akhlaq because we will, be, we will be in class together, and uh, it shouldn't be that our sisters have to call out all the time to say that uh, uh, men were um, abusive towards them, whether through speech or physically. Mm. And uh, we understand that many students do get married just after university as well. So if it is a time that people are looking for, for par partners, we shouldn't ignore that and say, no, they shouldn't be speaking at all. We should rather be guiding people to say, this is what to look out for in, in somebody that you one, one day be with, someone that is on the right path of Dean, knows their Akira, knows their rights as responsibilities as men and women, understands that they want to benefit society. And hopefully by doing so, when people leave university and plan their, their marriages, inshallah, it's not being done um, in a way that was harmful to the, the Akira as, as students at university. Um, Another issue, I think, is disengagement. So we spoke about privilege before. Um, our Muslim students are mostly disengaged from the broader issues in our society. And I think it is because of being um, tight-knit. And alhamdulillah for the tight-knit. You know, many people speak about the tight-knit of the old, uh, where people help one another and communities were um, for, there for one another. But unfortunately, at university, um, if we're not going to be more broad and more um, uh, harmonious in our approach about who is Muslim and about you know looking beyond the way people dress and the way people sound when it comes to Islam and who represents Islam, um, we're going to be facing issues where people either leave the deen or sit at the very fringes of our community. And um, it only comes back to bite us 20, 30 years later when that leads to broader issues in our society. So the Muslim Students Association, alongside with our Muslim students at campus, need to be taking a larger stance in terms of being open-minded about uh, bringing people in and the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah being the unifying factor. And inshallah, by doing so, uh, the, the issues that's, that, that um, are ruling our societies, whether it is gender-based violence, whether it is ignorance, whether it is privilege and crass materialism, that these issues can actually be eradicated. And first, starting off with us who are young, because one day we will be um, moving on to parts of society of influence. And if we are remaining the same, then unfortunately we will see no change in our society. Shakil Gadda, shukran so much for your time this evening. We really appreciate it. And all the best. Shukran uh, to you, Malana, and to uh, ITV as well. And we're asking the community to please make to I and keep us in your du'as as well and support us in any way that you can as the MSA, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right, that was the newly elected uh, president of MSA Union, Shakil Gadda, joining us on the program this evening. We take our final break when we come back thereafter. It's Thought for the Week. Welcome back to the program. Now, we had Shakil Garda, the uh, newly elected president of the MSA Union, on the program just uh, before the break. We had him for, for the first uh, few segments of the program. And it's nice to see, mashallah, these young, energetic uh, Muslims who are going out there and trying to make a difference. Uh, it's so easy when you're studying to say, well, I'm so overwhelmed by my studies. I've got so much to do. Let me just continue with my, um, with my studies. Uh, let me just focus on my studies. But um, it, it, it starts at this level, right? Even before this level. From the time they are in school, primary school, then madrasa, then high school, we should try and get uh, our children to get involved in, in community affairs in, in whichever way suits their talents and suits their interests and suits their strengths. Um, not everyone will do it in the same way. Not everyone is cut out to do the same thing. Uh, so that when they come to university, they can, they can upscale it a little bit. Uh, we should, you know, a big problem facing the Muslim community in general, really, is that um, you've got uh, too many people who are self-centered, who are very individualistic, who are very focused on only what they need to achieve and, and, and their goals and their objectives and, and their hopes and their desires and their fears and their insecurities. So youngsters who take initiative 
we should support them, we should compliment them, we should encourage them, uh, we should guide them, we should advise them, we should assist them. We shouldn't leave them on their own. And, and uh, the more we will do that, the more we will find other youngsters coming to the fore, inshallah, and, and, and doing the same, the more we will find other youngsters uh, taking up the cudgels. And it's so nice, it's, it's so encouraging to see uh, youngsters who have their, their, their fingers on the pulse, who understand the issues of the day, who are going out, trying to make a difference, all the while still having to do justice to their studies, uh, still having to try and get the best marks that they can get for their own uh, career prospects, for their own um, economic prospects. And this is what we need to be encouraging our children to do. Uh, sometimes we kind of only do it from, from a very, again, selfish kind of perspective. Uh, my son, you must take part in the, the speech contest, or my daughter, you must, you, must, you must endeavor to become head prefect, because it's a, it's a status thing, right? It's a status thing. So if my, my son takes part in the speech contest and wins, then I'll get the best speech writer to write a speech for him so that he must prevail and come number one. What, what, what are we really trying to achieve there? And, and, and what are we achieving in the end of the day? So, okay, somebody will write for him a, a, a perfect speech, uh, he'll go out there, and nowadays I understand that there are people who get paid. You know, they offer their services to write speeches. Uh, so you write the speech, and the person memorizes it, and they distort all the hand gestures and everything. And here he goes, and he delivers it par excellence, and wins the prize. And he's proud, and his parents are even more proud. And, you know, go, my, my boy or my girl, you've, you've, you've done very well. Uh, so when we, when we push them into activities, it's more, you know, because we want to see them personally excel. Go take part in the cricket or take part in the sports or take part in this because you need to come top. You need to stand out. You need to show yourself as above, um, a, a cut above the rest. Uh, pursuing excellence, there's nothing wrong in that. You know, encouraging your children to take part in sports, uh, to take part in the speech contest and all of that. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying for a moment that, that, is, that, is, that it's problematic. I'm saying that the way we do it and the intention with which we do it. And thirdly, coming back to the point I was making, uh, apart from the intention with which we do it and the way in which we do it, it's about uh, not stopping there, going, getting them involved in initiatives that benefit the community. Not only when they require certain certificates, etc., during the student days, but imbibe within them. You are the best of nations because you have been taken out to be of service to humanity. You are going to become a doctor. Yes, you'll, you'll earn a livelihood, a good one at that, but also see how you can serve the creation of Allah. You're going to become a lawyer, you're going to become an alim, whatever it is you want to become. But that you cannot only teach them the day after they have graduated. That now you graduated, you know, go and do this and, and don't only focus on your own career and don't be self-centered and don't be selfish. You need to teach that much in advance, really. You need to teach that much in advance. So that is something that uh, we, we, we need to understand that get your children involved in activities that will broaden their scope, broaden their understanding, broaden their horizon, and get them involved in community activities. Get them involved at the masjid, get them to help when there's programs, when they have to serve. Uh, get them out of that, that zone where it's only about them, 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 and, and make it about us, make it about the community, make it about the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so that uh, they, can, they can do the kind of work that's done here because you don't get paid for it. Uh, but you learn a lot, you really do. And, and, and the, um, the result of this is that nowadays we're finding it very difficult in community organizations uh, to find capable people, capable people who are willing to serve, uh, you know, as trustees or as uh, board members, whether it be Muslim schools, whether it be masjids. Uh, everyone say, no, I don't have the time, you know, I don't, need the, I don't need the stress, I don't need the hassle, because you don't get paid for it, right? It's not like in the corporate world when you serve as a, sit as a director here or as a, sit as a director there, then uh, you, you, you get uh, paid a handsome fee, director's fees. You, you a, a mutawalli or a masjid committee member or a Muslim school board member, or you serve on the SGP, you don't get paid for these things. Um, next week, we're going to be talking uh, uh, to a member of the SGB as well as uh, the Department of Education. Now, you don't, you don't get paid for these things. And then what transpires is that uh, people that don't have interest, they don't have enthusiasm. Not, there are people who do, but there's not adequate uh, amounts of people. And that's why it needs to start from the time they are young, right up to the time they go to school, they go to university, uh, get them involved, encourage them as parents, as a community. We need to encourage them. We need to support them. Muslim businesses need to come to the party and, and, and support such initiatives. Now, the second thing that I wanted to discuss in this last segment in terms of my thoughts for the week is about um, social media and then how we are bordering on the absurd when it comes to social media. In recent weeks, we have seen certain videos go viral, right, 
of Muslim people doing unsavory things in public, uh, whether it is fighting in a shopping mall or fighting in a public space. Now, what was done was wrong, especially in a public space. If you have an issue, you have an altercation, um, as Muslims, there's a more dignified way of dealing with it. You don't go and deal with it in public. You don't use that kind of language. You don't let fists fly. It's wrong. I understand that. However, that's, that's, that's there. These things happen from time to time. They are wrong, but they happen from time to time. What really irritates me more than those people who lost their cool, lost their temper, and started fighting in public are the people who take up the, the mobile and start videoing it. Really, what, what kind of mindset uh, have, we, have we developed that when you see an altercation taking place, when you see people who have lost their cool, lost their temper, for whatever reason, uh, however wrong they may be, and now they're going at each other in public, all we're interested in doing is, is taking a video. Then one is you take a video and the other is now you circulate it. Really? What, what, what's the benefit in it? For what purpose? For what reason? So imagine, Allah forbid, we are all humans. We are all fallible. We all have our weaknesses. We all have our shortcomings. Imagine, Allah forbid, you have a, a, a bad moment publicly and then somebody goes and, and videos it. Somebody goes and then circulates it and makes it go, go viral. How will you feel? How will your parents feel? How will your family feel? You know, uh, at the radio, we got a call from the family members of, of some of those who, who were involved in that, in that altercation that was videoed and said, you know, for Allah's sake, please don't, uh, don't report on it. They said, we don't intend to. This is not news. So someone had a spat in public, it's regrettable, it is, it is embarrassing from, in terms of the Muslim community. But those who saw it, saw it. The 50, 100 people who were in the, in the vicinity. But when we videoed it and made it go viral, that's when we made the situation worse. Really, what's the purpose? I'm hearing stories, I don't know how true it is, that nowadays even when an accident takes place, when an accident takes place, when cars stop before they actually go and see who's injured, who's in the throes of death, who requires immediate assistance, they first want to video. They first want to take pictures. Is it, is it that we've just lost our marbles? We've, we've just gone crazy. We're bordering on the insane when it comes to social media. Social media has its benefits. I'm also uh, on the social media platforms. I have a Twitter, I have uh, Facebook, I have Instagram, WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp has made life ma much easier for many of us, including myself. You, you, you can get so much of work done without having to be physically present at a particular place, without having to physically meet with a particular person. But everything has its limitations. Everything requires discipline. There are certain things that are not to be videoed. There are certain things that are not to be circulated. Not, you know, every one of us wants to be that person who creates a sensation now. Uh, I'm hearing about this TikTok. I don't know too much about it, but um, from what I understand, it's a lot about humor, and it's also a lot about putting these embarrassing things onto a public platform. Why? Really? Uh, it just embarrasses certain people further. It just spreads negativity further. What benefit was there in whoever took those videos of these altercations that took place in recent weeks and started spreading it? What, what is the benefit? You know, what is you, you have a criminal activity, somebody's car was stolen and now you take the CCTV footage and you circulate it so people can see how they operate and how they maneuver and you can learn from that and you can better protect yourself. I understand that. I, I can get that. But someone has a squabble. Maybe friends are out and then things get a bit heated and now they go at each other. It's wrong. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not negating that. It's regrettable. They should not have done it in public. It's unacceptable behavior for any human, especially a, a, a Muslim. But why do we need to video it? What kind of person does that? Um, how, how, how far are we going to get carried away with this whole wanting to, to be the, you know, the person who, who divulges, the one who gets it to go viral, the one who's got that, that, that footage? This is a kind of tabloid uh, mentality. Is it that we're too exposed to these tabloids, you know, wanting to capture everything, people's embarrassing moments, people's uh, weak moments, and then, you know, circulating it for all and sundry, causing further embarrassment? Imagine if that was your son. Imagine if that was your father. Imagine if that was your brother. How would you feel if somebody else captured it and just spread it around? So we need to be very careful. I think we need to be responsible. We need to be mature because in the end of the day, perhaps it would not be known who took the video and who circulated it in this world, but Allah knows. Allah knows. And then you will be taken to account because you have caused pain to people. Even though they may have been guilty of a wrong in public, you have caused pain, you have caused embarrassment, you have caused reputational damage in somebody's father, brother, sister, child, you know. And, and, and we need to understand that from an Islamic perspective, it's totally problematic. So ourselves as adults and also our children, let, let's teach them. You know, certain things are not to be videoed. We cannot 
We cannot lose our, our sense of sanity and morality and discipline and, and, and balance and, and maturity and ethics uh, just to make videos go viral and just to, uh, you know, feed the sensation machine. I hope that uh, this message uh, uh, resonates and that uh, people understand this and, and take heed. May Allah grant me and all of us the tawfiq. As always, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to be in your company on uh, ITV. We were coming to you live this evening from our studios in Sunning Hill, Johannesburg. Until next week, inshallah, fi amanillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.